You know how I spent three months planning, recording, and editing a three hour documentary about all of the characters of Don't Start Together after they all had received their reworks and you guys loved it? Yeah, well, um, of course, less than a week after I upload that video, the developers of Don't Starve Together, Clay, decide now is the perfect time to release a bit into the game which uh, adds skill trees to three of the characters, <laughs> and also insinuates that all the other characters in the game will eventually be given skill trees too! Whee! So yeah, in the newest update, Wolfgang, Woody, and Wormwood were given skill trees like Wilson, except of course, all the skills are different and it is a very good update, and thankfully, it doesn't actually change any of the characters' already existing abilities, it simply adds on top of them. So my three-hour our video about all the characters is still correct, it just doesn't talk about anyone's skill trees except for Wilson. Despite that, the skill trees do have a massive impact on how the characters play. In the case of Wolfgang, it simply buffs him, whereas with Woody, it fixes the parts of the character which made him horrible to play. So I will be making a video on each of the characters' skill trees as they are released, starting with this video talking about Woody's skill tree. I'm doing Woody first because out of Wolfgang, Wormwood and Woody, Woody has been improved the most with his skill tree, so let's just get started with Woody's default abilities, perks and quirks, and and then we will talk about his skill tree skills, what they're best used for, and how good they are. And if you just want to see the skill tree, you can use the timestamps to skip ahead, or you can just watch the whole video, that's cool too. Anyway, let's start. Woody is a lumberjack who has 150 health, hunger, and 200 sanity. He also has a curse, giving him the ability to transform into three different monsters. But before that, the first monster Woody has to deal with is in his backpack, Lucy. Lucy is an infinite durability axe which Woody starts with, and Lucy will chop trees at a higher efficiency than a normal axe. To be exact, one chop from Lucy is the equivalent of two chops from a normal axe, but only Woody can use Lucy. If anyone else tries to pick her up, she is immediately dropped. Lucy will also drive you insane by constantly talking to you about how she wants to chop trees, it's sad that she's being left alone, or how she's getting off on chopping trees. Anyway, Woody also goes through the chopping animation about twice as fast as normal characters, regardless of what axe he is using. As Woody destroys forests so fast, the forests fight back by having a slightly higher chance to spawn tree guards when Woody chops a tree. And Woody has a beard which helps him in winter by slowing down how fast he loses body temperature, but in summer will work against you of course. Now we will talk about the transformations. When Woody eats two monster foods within 4 minutes, or it's a full moon, or Woody eats one of the three corresponding idol seeking craft, he will transform into one of the three were creatures. Were beaver is the transformation which is built for working. More specifically, it chops at an even higher efficiency than Lucy, taking only 5 bites to knock down a living tree, so one bite is equivalent to 4 chops from a normal axe. Along with having a chopping animation faster than a normal character, but not as fast as Woody. The Werebeaver can also bite things to dig them up with only one bite, and the Werebeaver can also mine and hammer, but the Werebeaver's mining and hammering capabilities are not so efficient. They are slower than a normal player, taking 11 bites to mine a normal rock in 172 frames or 2.866 seconds, and yes I will be as precise as counting the frames in this video, which would take a normal player 167 frames or 2.7833 seconds, which means the beaver is only a little bit slower than the normal player, and the beaver takes 13 bites to knock down a pig house over 229 frames, whereas a normal player only takes 4 swings from a hammer over 106 frames or 1.76 seconds. So the beaver hammering is twice as slow as a player. While chopping trees, the werebeaver negates the chance to spawn tree guards, which if you ask me, is more of a disadvantage. But anyway, the werebeaver also moves 10% faster than a normal character, along with having a small 25% built-in damage reduction. Uh, and that is all for the base werebeaver. In the skill tree section, we will discuss how the werebeaver is improved with its skills, but that's not till later. Next is the weremoose. The weremoose is the combat transformation and as such has a massive 90% damage reduction, equivalent to a full side body's damage reduction, except the moose's damage reduction has infinite durability until you transform back. The moose deals 59.5 damage per attack, but its attacks are slower than a normal player. Attacking at an attack rate of 1.75 times per second, normal characters including Woody attack exactly 2 times per second. So the moose's DPS is 12.5% less than Woody using a handbat, but the skills later on will change us, so we'll talk about that later. The moose also moves slower with a 0.9 times speed modifier, so about 10% slower than a normal character, and finally has a charging ability, which puts you into a charging state where the moose will hit everything in its path for 59.5 damage and charges for 5 tiles before stopping. The moose will also stop early if it runs too close to the edge of walkable land. If the moose runs into an object while charging, it will deal damage to the object like a hammer and the moose will walk slowly for about 10 seconds before recovering back to normal speed. The Were-Goose is the third transformation and is a lot simpler than the other two, so the Were-Goose cannot attack, has no damage 
introduction, but does move 1.4 times faster than a normal character. So this transformation is for scouting, but not just for scouting the land, but also the ocean, as the Weregoose can run and stand on water without drowning. Uh, and that's it, the goose gets more complex later when we talk about its skill tree skills, but that's all it does in its base form. All these wear forms have night vision, 240 cold and heat insulation, and are 70% waterproof, while also all of them will slowly drain your wear meter, unless you're not doing their corresponding task, in which case the wear meter drains very fast. For the wear beaver, you must be working, for the wear moose, you must be fighting, and for the wear goose, you must be running. All the wear forms drain your sanity by minus six per minute. The wear forms cannot pick up or interact with items while transformed, so you can't pick up anything or interact with anything in your inventory, including eating food to heal, and anything you're wearing upon transforming will be dropped, except for backpacks. They stay equipped upon transforming. The longest you could stay transformed is four minutes except during full moons, in which case your wear meter is set back to max and it drains at half of the usual rate. And lastly, when you transform back from being a wear creature, your hunger will be set back to zero no matter what your hunger was before you transformed. We mentioned earlier how to transform, but let's be a little more specific. Eating two monster food of any kind within four minutes, or being on the surface during a full moon, will cause Woody to transform into one of the wear creatures randomly. This can be avoided by going into the caves, by already being transformed, or by unlocking a skill on the skill tree, which we will talk about later. If you want to transform into a specific wear creature, you can craft one of the three corresponding idols. Upon eating the idol, it will deal 20 damage to you and you will lose 15 sanity. Then you'll be transformed into the corresponding wear creature. Woody has a loyalty recruitment skill in that when he recruits bunny men, pig men, and rock lobsters, they'll stick around for longer than if they were recruited by a normal character. And lastly, Woody's favorite food is honey nuggets, which makes it almost as good as meatballs for hunger for Woody while also healing him for 20 health. Now that's Woody at his base form without his skill tree. So now we will discuss his skill tree, what all the skills do, what they're best used for, and my recommended skill tree setup. We'll start from the left and work our way down the skill tree, then move on to the next section to the right. But firstly, to unlock insight points to spend on skills, you must survive. To be exact, every 10 days you survive, you gain one insight point, and you can gain a maximum of 15. If you want to cheat and unlock all of the insight points, simply join a world that you own and use command C underscore skip open bracket 160 close bracket, which skips ahead 160 days and instantly gives you all 15 insight points. But I'm afraid you can only do this on PC. Sorry, Switch and console. Any insight points you earn will be shared across all the worlds you join, so think of them as saved to your profile. And you can only choose how you spend your skills when you join a new world or when you use a Moonrock Idol on the Celestial Portal to switch characters. Now, let's talk about the skills you can spend these insight points on. <sighs> Wait, viewer! Viewer, stop! D don't listen to Jakey! If you keep watching, he'll try to rot your brain by explaining mechanics like planar damage and defense. Instead, you should listen to me, Banjo the Business Pig, and my new business partner, Maxwell Gaming. Huh? Go on, tell them what you have there, Maxwell Gaming. Oh, I got sent a free gaming phone from Red Magic. Red Magic is a very cool company who makes premium gaming phones and peripherals, but today they sent Maxwell Gaming, their new Red Magic AS Pro gaming phone, which has the latest and greatest hardware, like a 120 hertz refresh rate display, 512 gigabytes of storage, 16 gigs of RAM, and their fastest CPU to date, meaning it will be able to handle any game on mobile. Speaking of which, I played a little Don't Starve on the AS Pro, Don't Starve Pocket Edition, and wow, this version of Don't Starve is so outdated. It's single player, but with Reign of Giants. <gasps> Sweet, Not that I saw any giants, because after about two hours, I found, oh. Let's go! Woo! After entering Maxwell's door and beginning adventure mode, I was promptly thrown into King of Winter, the hardest mode in adventure mode, where I would start freezing every few seconds. I'm cold already? You've got to be kidding me. But wait, there's hope. Yes! <sighs> Sorry. I acquired my bunny earmuffs to give me insulation from the cold. What? Uh, be bees are snipers in single player. They have pretty big range. Tis not a problem, as the touchstone I touched earlier revived me. Then I made it to date. Well, maybe you could survive longer in adventure mode, but you know, make sure you do it on the Red Magic AS Pro. And yes, this is every mobile game that has ever sponsored me. Wow, all of which run great on this gaming phone, as you would expect. Red Magic sent me this phone at the start of July and I've been using it daily since. Uh, my favorite feature so far is the fast fingerprint sensor on the front to unlock the phone, although I use my thumb, the vibrant and smooth display, and the fact that the phone could be completely recharged in 40 minutes from 0% battery. So if you're interested in getting yourself or someone else a premium phone, or if you just want to go look at the specs to see how good the phones really are, uh, then click at the link in the description, and thanks to Red Magic for sponsoring the video. Wow. <laughs> Get out of 
up my skill tree guy view now. <laughs> Alright, dealt with those two. Now, anyway, back to the skill tree. The first skill simply increases your maximum transformation time by 48 seconds. So now you can stay transformed for 4 minutes of 48 seconds, which is 20% longer than the default 4 minute maximum. The second upgrade adds an additional 48 seconds of that, so now your maximum transformation time is 5 minutes and 36 seconds, resulting in an increase of 40% over the default timer. And lastly, transformation timer 3, which adds an additional 96 seconds to your maximum transformation time, resulting in a massive transformation time of 7 minutes and 12 seconds which is 80% more than the original 4 minute timer. This is a generic but universally useful skill as it means less interruptions during your transformations, especially as the moose when you're trying to fight. And if you want to transform back early, simply standing still while also not doing the corresponding task will drain your wear meter as if you didn't have these duration extending skills. Initially, me and the Twitch chat thought that this was a bug, but now that I'm thinking about it, this seems intentional so that the skill doesn't force you to stay as a wear creature longer with the skill if you want to transform back than if you wanted to transform back but didn't have the skills. As a comparison, here's a woody with and without the duration skills both standing still. You'll see the woody with the skills transform back only 12 frames later than the woody with no transformation skills. This shows that after transforming, the initial drain rate is reduced by the skills, but once it's draining because you are stood still and not doing the correct task, then it drains just as fast without the skills. To confirm this, here's another test case, a woody with and without skills both being transformed at the same time, except this time they're running around, but still not doing the corresponding task. How fast will they transform back? Well, woody with no skills begins transforming back after 26 seconds exactly, but the woody with the skills stays transformed for 38 seconds exactly. This proves that the skills don't increase your maximum capacity of your wear meter, but instead it just makes it drain slower than normal as long as you're not standing still and not doing the corresponding task. The next skill below the timer is Curse Embracer. This skill is unlocked once you have 6 points on any of the curse skill trees in the curse section. So for example, learning 3 timer skills and 3 of any of the wear creature specific skills will unlock this skill. This skill removes the negative part of eating the idol to transform transform, meaning you no longer lose 20 health or 15 sanity when eating an idol. Also, after transforming back, you won't be starving, you will always transform back with 22.5 hunger. This is pretty useful as it gives you an extra 20 health to utilize while you're transformed, along with the extra sanity so you aren't as likely to go insane while transformed. Pretty decent, you'll probably be using the skill. Now is where it gets good, we have entered the Were Creature skill trees. These are why this skill tree is so good. Uh, let's start with the Were Beaver section. The first skill, Were Beaver 1, simply says that you'll mine faster in your Were Beaver form. But but how much faster? After testing with the skill, it takes 5 bytes to mine a normal rock, whereas before it used to take 11 bytes. But it's actually better than just taking one less swing to break a rock, because the Werebeaver's mining animation is faster than a normal player with a pickaxe. So the beaver takes 5 bytes over 1 second and 17 frames from uh, the start of the animation until the rocks break and you can see the rocks on the floor, whereas a player takes 6 swings over 2 seconds and 46 frames, um, so the beaver is over twice as fast as the player at mining rocks now. Next skill down is the same thing except for trees. To be more precise, without this skill, one bite is equal to four chops with a normal axe. But with this skill, one bite is now equal to seven chops. So now you can knock down small trees in one bite, medium trees in two bites, big trees in three bites, and living trees in three bites also. This skill improves the speed at which the beaver can destroy forest, which is good, but Maxwell, even without a skill tree, is still superior as he can chop and pick up at the same time, whereas the beaver cannot pick up what it chops while it is chopping. The third skill says chop, mine, and break hard materials in your web beaver form. But what? hard materials. Well, these are materials that include the Dreadstone Outcrop, which grows on top of a Nightmare Fisher after you defeat Asian Fuel Weaver, and then give the Shadow Hand 5 Dreadstone. Normally, if you try to mine this as the Werebeaver, you will gnaw at it, but it won't do any damage to the Dreadstone, and it will stagger you back slightly. But with this skill enabled, you will do damage to it, and it won't knock you back, along with only taking you 5 bites to break it to get 3 Dreadstone, whereas a player with a Ruins Pick Slash Axe can also mine it in 5 swings. Also, real quick, this Dreadstone Outcrop is defended by a new mini boss encounter, which is super Super cool, so I won't spoil too much, but the materials they drop are required to make very powerful armor, equipment, and a powerful weapon, which I may be using in a speedrun coming up. Also, there's a common misconception that people think, which is the Dreadstone Outcrop will only spawn on a Nightmare Fisher during the Nightmare Phase of the Ruins, but that's not true. The Dreadstone Outcrop will spawn as long as it isn't on cooldown, and will spawn on whichever Fisher you get close to first, even if the Nightmare Phase isn't active. Then shortly after that, the three mini bosses will spawn. Also, if you kill all the mini bosses first, the Dreadstone Outcrop despawns, so you have to mine it before defeating 
defeating the last mini boss. This skill also influences how you mine the crystal outcrops which spawn from the Lunar Rifts. You unlock Lunar Rifts by defeating Celestial Champion and giving Wagstaff the shard that Celestial Champion drops, and then the Lunar Rifts will begin spawning a few days after. And while the Lunar Rifts are active, they will spawn crystal outcrops, which can be mined for pure brilliance. Now, oddly, the Web Beaver can mine these crystal outcrops regardless if you have the skill unlocked or not, but without the skill, you have a chance to be very briefly knocked back while mining it. And if you are knocked back, the strike which caused you to get knocked back seems to do partial damage to the crystal. Definitely some damage, but not nearly as much damage as a successful strike, though it only takes you about 16 successful strikes to break the crystal. But with the skill, you simply don't get knocked back while mining it, and it will take 16 strikes, which you now cannot fail. Whether you have this skill or not, you still mine crystals significantly faster than a player with a normal pickaxe, as when a player is staggered back, they are staggered for a much longer animation. And of course, they also take more swings to break the crystal, about 32 swings with a normal or golden pickaxe. Uh, and as, as a final quick comparison, a normal player with a ruins pick slash axe won't fail a swing versus a crystal and breaks it in 15 swings, whereas the beaver also won't fail a swing but does it in 16 swings. And lastly, this skill allows you to activate the Nightmare Wear Pig's Pillars, as in you can make them vibrate to cause him to be unleashed and begin the fight. Normally you can only do this with a pick slash axe from the ruins. The skill does specifically say chop, mine, and break hard materials, but at the moment there are only hard materials which you can mine, none which you can chop or hammer, and the Wear Beaver is just as bad at hammering things with this skill versus without. Next is the skill we've been leading up to, the Wear Beaver Mastery skill, which unlocks an ability you can do by right clicking on your screen while you're the Wear Beaver. After doing this, the Wear Beaver will slam its tail on the ground where you're standing, unleashing destructive shock waves, which can break basically everything that can be chopped, mined, hammered, or broken. Whoa. More precisely, right clicking drains 5 flat wear points from your wear meter and the tail slap will cause damage to any object in a 1.5 tile radius around the wear beaver. This slam destroys most objects in one hit, but after diving deeper and watching the footage back slowly, what this slam actually does is 3 rounds of destruction. The first round is within a very close radius around where the wear beaver hits the ground, hitting everything within about a half a tile radius around the wear beaver. The second round seems to hit everything in a 1 tile radius around the wear beaver, and finally the third round seems to hit everything Thing in about a one and a half tile radius around it. This means if a tree is within all three radii, they will be hit by all three rounds of destruction, which would knock down a fully grown tree or a living tree with just one tail slap. Diving even deeper, we figured out that one round of destruction is like one gnaw from the wear beaver in the context of tree destruction. Meaning if a tree is hit by all three rounds of destruction, it's like being hit three times by the wear beaver. Except of course it applies in an area around the wear beaver. But also this rule doesn't apply to rocks as something like a golden rock is broken as soon as it's hit by one round of destruction. But, but then like a crystal spawned by the lunar rift is destroyed after being hit by two rounds of destruction. Uh, so the point is anything destructible or diggable will be finished off with one round of destruction, unless it's a crystal from the lunar rift, in which case it takes two rounds of destruction. Remember though, that one tail slap does three rounds of destruction, so these are all still destroyed within one tail slap. But the tail slap seems slightly inconsistent, as sometimes you can be stood next to a level three tree and perform the tail slam, but the tree only receives two hits. But most of the time it will be hit by all three destruction waves. After some testing, it's almost as if each destruction wave is a ring around the wear beaver with an increasing size and area in which it affects. And sometimes, if you're too close to an object, it either doesn't get hit by the first or third destruction wave, but only sometimes. It is somewhat common to replicate unless they fix it, just stand right next to a tree and perform the tail slam. Sometimes it will only get hit twice. But that's not all. <laughs> you can also deal area of effect damage to mobs with the tail slam, but it has a very specific behavior in that if you do a tail slam without the enemy you want to hit within the first small radius of half a tile, then none of the destruction waves will deal any damage to the enemy. But if the enemy is within the first half tile radius, then two of the three destruction waves will hit them, as seemingly the third wave is too far out to hit the enemy once they're within the half tile radius around the web either. Each round of destruction that hits an enemy deals a normal gnawing damage of 27.2, but against structures or enemies which aren't living like a spider nest, it deals 44.2 damage per destruction wave. This skill is insanely productive as it's basically a mini bear slam and the bear is one of the best ways to knock down trees very fast. So as the wear beaver, you have become death, destroyer of forests. <laughs> Except when it bugs out and doesn't want to hit trees. Anyway, the tail slap seemingly does not get affected by Wally's honey spice, which normally increases work efficiency such that things require less chops to knock down trees, etc. Now, moving on to the wear moose section, the combat transformation. Let's see how he has improved, and don't worry, he definitely has been improved. The first skill says your wear moose form is more resistant to hitting objects and walks a little faster. Normally, when the moose charges into an object, it does damage to the object and the moose will be stuck walking slowly for just under 10 seconds. 
but after you apply the skill, you will walk slowly for less than 20 frames, which is one third of a second. So it's a massive improvement, so you're not stuck walking slowly after running into something. And as for the second part of the skill, walks a little faster, what this actually means is you walk as fast as Wilson. Or do you? Because when we looked at the code, we found this absolute disgrace of a formula. The moose has a 0.9 times speed modifier, and then what they do with the skill is they multiply it by 1.11 to try to make it equal 1, the same as Wilson. But 0 0.9 multiplied by 1.11 actually equals 0 0.999. So the moose technically moves 0.001% slower than Wilson with this skill. Still a much needed improvement as before the moose moved at 0.9 times the speed of Wilson. Next we have a skill which I even suggested in my Woody Boss Run video. The moose now has health regeneration, specifically 1.5 health every 5 seconds. Uh, it is that simple with no super secret mechanics which make it more complex, but 1.5 health every 5 seconds means you regenerate 18 health per minute, or through a whole transformation being 7 minutes 12 seconds, you'll regenerate about 129 health. So it is noticeable, but not so rapid that you can be reckless and tank everything without dying. But if you pair this health regeneration with jelly beans, which you would eat before transforming, they would heal you for 2 health every 2 seconds for 2 minutes, granting you 120 extra healing for 2 minutes during your first 2 minutes of being transformed, giving you a total healing potential of 156 within your first 2 minutes of your transformation. Which is way bigger, but of course, after the first 2 minutes, the jelly bean effect runs out and you're back to healing 18 health per minute. Still a very good skill. The third skill of the Wermoose allows you to stop during your charge attack. Normally you cannot cancel this attack and will always travel the full 5 tiles before stopping, only stopping early if you charge toward the edge of the land. To be exact, you can stop the charge attack after traveling for 1.75 tiles, which is significant as traveling too far was a good reason not to use the charge, but now you can cancel it anywhere between 1.75 to 5 tiles. Now the best change to the Moose is the final Moose skill, Wermoose Mastery. It says the Wermoose learns to throw a strong planar punch on every third hit and gains a natural defense against planar enemies. Alright, time out. What's planar damage and planar defense? Well, I haven't discussed it yet in a video, and now the time has come. This is as complicated as it gets with working out damage formulas in Don't Starve Together, so hold on tight, we're gonna be doing some math. Planar enemies are enemies which have a special trait called planar defense. What planar defense does is it puts your physical damage with all of your damage multipliers through this formula, and that's the damage you will do to the planar enemy. So for example, a Wilson with no allegiance to Luna or Shadow or any other damage modifiers using a tentacle spike, which normally deals 51 damage, will only deal 33.5 damage to a planar defense enemy. It's kind of hard to understand what this formula is actually doing, but in plain English, it reduces physical damage and reduces it more the higher the initial physical damage was. For example, Wilson with a tentacle spike deals 51 down to 33.5, which is a decrease of 35%. Whereas Wolfgang with no allegiance or skills active, but while mighty, with a tentacle spike and spicy bulk goat jelly against a wet target would normally deal 306 damage, but against a wet planar defense enemy deals 111.55 damage, which is a decrease of 63.5% of the initial damage. So as you can see, the more physical damage you do, the more it gets reduced. Also to be clear, electric damage from bulk goat jelly counts as physical damage in this formula. Now that we understand what a planar defense enemy is, what is planar damage? Thankfully, it is a lot simpler, kind of. <laughs> planar damage simply pierces planar defense. It's that simple, uh, but despite that, I'm about to make it complicated. Now let's say Wilson uses a bright shade sword which deals 38 physical and 30 planar damage and he hits a normal enemy with no armor. We will deal the full 68 damage. Cool. But now against a lunar planar defense enemy, Wilson will deal 56.8 damage. This is because the formula now looks like this. So the physical damage aspect 38 gets reduced by the formula, then the 30 planar damage is applied after the reduction of the physical damage. So the physical gets reduced down to 26.8, then the 30 planar damage is applied on top, totaling 56.8 damage. Planar damage also pierces physical damage reduction. For example, if you have a bright shade sword and you hit a pig man with a football helmet on, the physical 38 is reduced by 80%, but the 30 power damage completely pierces the football helmet, resulting in 37.6 damage. This also applies to you! So if you fight an enemy which does power damage, like the deadly bright shade, which with its vine whip attack deals 65 physical damage and 10 planar damage, and you're wearing a football helmet for 80% physical damage reduction, you will receive 23 damage. So 65 physical damage reduced by the football helmet reduces it to 13, but then you get hit by 10 planar damage, so you get hit for 23 damage total. But now, let's mix in some of our own planar defense. Now, planar defense armor is different from being a planar defense enemy. Planar defense enemies reduce physical damage with the formula we talked about, whereas planar defense armor, which provides planar defense, is a lot simpler. If I now get hit by the deadly bright shade with its fine whip attack while wearing a void cowl, Wilson only receives 13 damage. That is because the void cowl reduces physical damage by 80%, but also gives you a flat plus 10 planar defense. So the physical damage 65 is reduced by 80%, giving us 13. Then the planar damage is meant to deal 10 extra damage, but the cow reduces that instance of planar damage by a flat 10, so it deals. 
deal zero additional damage, causing us to only take 13 damage in total. And the reason I'm not staying consistent and using the bright shade equipment like the helmet here is because the damage formula just gets more complicated with allegiance bonuses. Because since the bright shade helmet is a lunar aligned piece of equipment and I'm being hit by a lunar enemy, the bright shade helmet would provide an extra 10% physical damage reduction after the initial 80%, along with an extra 10% planar damage reduction. So the damage formula would be this. Except you'll notice that this formula equals 10.7, but in game, I'm being hit for 11.7. That's because in game, if the planar part of the formula drops below zero, the value is zero, but we're not allowed to reduce the damage below zero, so it's set to zero. With this rule applied, it equals 11.7. So yeah, it gets a little more complicated when you add different damage modifiers. This is the basics of planar defense and planar damage, and this will become a lot more complicated in the Wolfgang Guide, as there are a lot more damage multipliers floating around, which are applied in weird places against unsuspecting values, which took us like two hours to figure out and reverse engineer on stream, so look forward to the Wolfgang Guide. But all of this was to explain the Moose's planar damage and defense. Let's first tackle the planar defense part as it's the simplest part. The Moose simply gains 45% planar damage reduction and then a flat 15 planar defense on top of that. This is also combined with his already existing 90% physical damage reduction. So if Woody, with no allegiance as the Moose, got hit by the deadly bright shade of Vine attack, it would normally deal 65 physical damage and 10 planar damage. But running it through the formula and applying the rule that we cannot reduce damage below zero, it will deal 6.5 damage. To confirm that this formula is indeed correct, let's let the Moose get hit by the spike attack, which happens if you attack the Bright Shade without first destroying its vines. This attack normally deals 100 physical damage and 30 planar damage, but if we run it through the formula, it will deal 11.5 total damage to the Moose. Then the formula looks like this, 100 multiplied by 1 minus the Moose's physical damage reduction, plus the planar aspect, which is 30 planar damage, multiplied by 1 minus the Moose's planar damage reduction, and then minus the flat 15 planar defense. So basically, the Moose is tankier against a planar damage dealing enemy than Wilson with a full set of Bright Shade armor, which also provides planar damage reduction. Very tanky indeed. Moving on to the Moose's third consecutive punch, which deals planar damage. The first two punches before the third punch will be normal physical damage punchies. Punchies? <laughs> I wrote punchies in the script. Punches! And then the third attack, the Moose will slam the ground, hitting everything in a small area of effect around him, dealing 136 physical damage and 80 planar damage. To be more precise, the radius is small, like really small, less than a half a tile radius around the Moose, while also hitting your target. And it seems that there's another small area of effect around your target, though I couldn't find the code referencing how this attack area of effect works, but from what I can tell, like I said, there's a small half tile radius around the Moose and your target, which will hit all enemies inside both radii, but it will also hit your target who can be as far as half a tile away from you. And I say third consecutive attack because this third special attack only happens on your third hit of a hit streak. So if you dodge, move, step away, stop attacking, or get staggered, you lose your attack streak and restart from punch one. But there is a small caveat to this, which is normally if you get hit, you get staggered and your attack streak resets. This is true if you have landed none or your first punch on an enemy, but if you've landed your second punch on an enemy as the moose, you you seemingly become a lot more resistant to stagger, which means as long as you keep attacking, you'll definitely get your third punch to land, which starts you back at punch one, which means you can be staggered again until you land your second punch. Also, the streak doesn't reset if you switch targets, just as long as you don't move very far and you switch targets fast. For example, if five hounds are attacking you and you hold F, your streak won't reset due to switching targets as they die, as they'll be all close to you and within your range, so when you hold F and a hound dies, the game switches to the next closest hound without resetting your streak. Anyway, against a planar enemy, the 136 physical damage is reduced to 66.6, .6, but the entire 80 planar damage pierces, so it deals 146.6 .6 damage total. So the Moose's third punch is very powerful versus planar enemies, so now against a normal defense enemy, I should deal like the full 136 physical damage and 80 planar damage, right? Wait. Wait, what's this? How come against normal enemies, I only deal 136 damage? We saw before that planar damage normally hits normal defense enemies no problem. So what's happening? Well, after hours of testing and checking the code, despite all the planar damage we talked about earlier, for whatever reason, it seems that when you're fighting a normal defense enemy as the moose, the planar damage just doesn't get applied at all. But again, this only applies to the moose and to nothing else in the game. It's very possible that this is a bug, but I think it's probably something that looks like a bug, but is done intentionally as a balancing mechanic. As let's now discuss the Moose's DPS as it is in-game, and then what it would be if this bug was fixed. Against a normal defense target, assuming you do two punches and never miss the third area of effect punch, you will deal 159.375 DPS, being two punches at 59.5 damage each, then one big punch at 136 damage, totaling 255 damage, but this takes 1.6 seconds to execute. Yes, I counted the frames, it takes 96 frames at 60 FPS. Therefore, the DPS is 255 divided by 1.6, so 159.375, which is 17.2 
50% more DPS than Wilson with a Dark Sword with no skills versus a normal defense target. But of course, the Moose is also great versus a plan on defense enemy. In fact, Wilson with no skills or affiliation or other damage modifiers and a Dark Sword deals 41.3 damage versus a plan on defense enemy, which is 82.6 DPS. While the Moose with no affiliation or other damage modifiers deals 138.5 DPS. But once Wilson acquires a Bright Shade Sword, which has planar damage, and a Bright Shade Helmet, which increases the Bright Shade Sword's damage, suddenly his DPS climbs to 127.6. Still less than the Moose, but not by much. The Moose has about 7% better DPS. Now let's think, what if against normal targets the planar damage actually went through and applied on top of the physical damage? Well, two punches makes 119 damage, and then the third punch would do 136 plus the 80 planar damage equals 335 over 3 hits, or 1.6 seconds. So 335 divided by 1.6 equals 209.375 DPS versus normal targets, assuming you never cancel your third punch. Wilson's DPS in the same scenario would be 136 DPS with a Dark Sword. So the Moose would deal roughly 50% more damage than Wilson, assuming that you never miss your third punch. Uh, now, in reality, you probably will miss your third punch occasionally, so you won't actually have 50% better damage than Wilson with a Dark Sword over a fight which isn't just holding F without interruption, which isn't a lot of fights. And to prove again how the plan damage isn't being applied to the normal target, if we give a dummy a football helmet, the damage is reduced down to 27.2, which is the 136 physical damage being reduced by 80%. Uh, if there was any planar damage, it would have pierced the physical damage reduction. So I think they should fix this so that the planar damage is applied no matter what enemy you're fighting, as the Moose versus normal defense targets right now isn't much better than Wilson with a Dark Sword, only 17.2% better. But then on the other hand, the Moose is very cheap and you can access it on day one with the right materials, so there is an argument for not buffing the Moose, but let me know what you think. Uh, and that's the Moose's skills done. So you can all relax, no more planar math. Moving on, we have the Goose and its skills. Firstly, this skill says run faster in your Goose form. Uh, oh, okay, but how fast? After testing, I couldn't quite replicate the speed of the Goose with using speed modifying gear on a character. The Goose would always be either slightly faster or slower and not exactly the same speed. Then I looked at the code and discovered why I couldn't replicate its speed. It's because they multiply the Goose's normal speed bonus of 1.4 by 1.19, which makes it 1.666, which is a very awkward number, which I'm pretty sure you can't replicate using any combination of speed items other than just using the Goose. Anyway, that's the Goose's run speed, 1.66 times rather than 1.4 times without the skill. The next skill says the Goose is now completely waterproof. This is a decent skill as you have 70% water protection already, but if you get wet and go insane as the Goose, you can't defend yourself, whereas the Beaver and Moose can fight back. This wetness immunity applies to everything, whether it's raining or your teammates are griefing you. The third skill says occasionally dodge an incoming attack while in the wear goose form. This is slightly vague and initially I thought it was a percent chance to dodge an attack, but after testing, it's actually a guaranteed dodge followed by a cooldown before you can use it again. In that, the goose will completely block one attack then the ability goes on cooldown for five seconds. I thought maybe that they used the bone armor code for this since the cooldown was the same, but it is not the same as the bone armor. The bone armor is activated by being hit while off cooldown, then once it activates, it blocks all damage for a short period. It's hard to test exactly how long this period is, but it's about half a second, maybe a little more. During this short period, no matter how many different things you get hit by, it will block all of it. Whereas the goose does not work this way. The goose blocks one instance of damage and any other damage will go through and hit you while the ability is off cooldown. The final goose skill states, the were goose learns to fly around to explore the world but it's a little out of control. Initially, this had me ecstatic. When I was on vacation and I read this ability, I honestly thought this ability allows you to go up in the air and fly around at super high speeds, but I'm sorry to disappoint you. Instead, what happens is the were goose flies up in the air. The screen turns black and you're teleported to a random point in the world. And each time you do this, it costs 20 flat wear points from your wear meter, regardless of if you have the duration skills or not. The way this teleport is executed matters as it could determine how useful this ability is for scouting the map for Luna Island or Mooncay Island. But here's what we found during testing. When you use the ability, you are sent to a random walkable tile in the world. This random tile is picked from a pool of all walkable tiles in one pool, regardless of if it is part of the main island, Luna Island, or Mooncay Island. This means that if you, for example, wanted to find Luna Island, your chances of landing on it is relative to how many walkable tiles Luna Island has relative to the rest of the world. So if the entire world had 160,000 tiles, 54,000 of them were walkable tiles, and of those 54,000, 5,000 of those tiles were on Luna Island, you'd have a 5,000 over 54,000 chance or 9.2% chance to land anywhere on Luna Island. And these numbers are based on a real default world map we generated and we approximated the total number of tiles, walkable tiles and Luna Island tiles. So only about a third of the entire map is walkable land. So lots of room on the ocean. Interesting. So using two or so goose isles to teleport around, you can get a clear view of what biomes are where in the overworld. And honestly, I think that's pretty good. You can make two goose isles in the first day and have a good grasp of where everything is before your second day. You can also use this ability in the caves and it's the same as on the overworld. You fly up and land 
land somewhere on a random walkable tile. Now, if you want to find the ruins and your ruins takes up, for example, 10% of your map, you have a 10% chance of landing on any spot in the ruins with the Goose Flying ability. After testing, you could pretty reliably find the entrance biome to the ruins or the ruins themselves within two where Goose forms, which is five teleports per form, so 10 teleports. Here's an example map where I had three Goose idols, so use 15 teleports. As you can see, I found the Lunar Grotter biome and a ruin set piece, as well as finding the Atrium. The problem you'll have after teleporting around is finding an exit to leave, so perhaps bring a third Goose idol for escaping the caves. Here's another real quick example where a map is 400 by 400 tiles, 5,000 of them were the ruins, 1,400 of them were the atrium, and 1,200 of them were the archives, which gives you an 8.7% chance to land anywhere in the ruins, 2.4% chance to land anywhere in the atrium, and a 2% chance of landing anywhere in the archives. Also, you can somewhat easily use this as a quick escape method from a tricky situation, as after a small starting animation, once you're in the air, you don't get hit. So create a small distance between you and your pursuer, then fly away, and hopefully you don't land in a more dangerous situation than you escape from. Finally, we're leaving the curse section and entering the Lombardak section, starting with the quick picker skills, which are pretty simple. They progressively let you pick things like grass, twigs, and berries off berry bushes a little faster each time you upgrade. I tested in a solo world how long it took to pick 50 grass that was stacked on top of each other to test the speed differences between no skills, level 1, 2, and 3. So here we go. With no skills, it took 60 seconds. With the level 1 skill, 54 seconds. With a level 2 skill, it took 48 seconds. And level 3, it took 40 seconds. So 10%, 20%, and 33.3% faster, respectively, than no skills. I looked at the code values for these skills, and interestingly, by default, picking grass should take one second, which would mean that by default it should have taken 50 seconds. But even though I was playing on a solo world hosted on my own local computer, it took 60 seconds. This is because of the input delay between switching to another piece of grass to pick, but at least it was consistent. Just know that the laggier you are, the worse this skill will be, as the skill doesn't reduce input delay between picking grass. Anyway, the code values for this skill says level 1 should be reducing the picking animation to 0.85 seconds, level 2 reduces it to 0.7 seconds, and level 3 reduces it to 0.55 seconds. In practice, these values don't really hold true due to the lag of the game has, so ignore these and just remember that level 1 makes you pick 10% faster, level 2 20% faster, and level 3 33.3% faster. Closer to the bottom of the lumberjack section, we have probably three of the highest value skills you can unlock. The first being woodworker, which says use Lucy to carve boards more efficiently. What this does is crafting boards with Lucy takes three logs rather than four, along with requiring Lucy in your inventory. Also, the animation is a little different than normal, but it takes the exact same amount of frames from start to finish as the original animation. In most long term worlds you'll need lots of logs to turn into boards and by crafting them using this skill you save 25% of your logs then you could use those logs to make more boards. Very simple and very resource friendly too. The next skill on the left says use Lucy to carve a nice hardwood hat for protection. With six logs, a pinecone and Lucy in your inventory you can craft a wood carved hat which gives 70% physical damage reduction and has 262.5 durability. For comparison a football hammer is 80% damage reduction with 315 durability. So in a team with a woody I would definitely have the whole team using wood carved hats rather than football helmets in case you run out of pigskin. Since armor is used so that you don't die super fast, in day-to-day -day combat I think 70% damage reduction is enough, but against bosses you probably want at least 80% depending on how confident you are. Also you can throw it in a fire at any durability for 180 seconds worth of fuel, so to be maximum resourceful you can wear it down to low durability, then before it breaks uh, use it on your campfire, or maybe even throw it in your ice finger mag. Also for whatever reason the hardwood hat crafting animation takes about a second and a half, whereas a normal crafting animation takes a second, so it is a little bit slower, but not too bad. The skill on the other side is called Cane Carving, and it says use Lucy to carve a wooden walking stick for easy mobility. This wooden walking stick requires Lucy to craft along with three logs and one charcoal. It gives 15% movement speed bonus while holding it, but also while holding it, its durability will be drained, regardless of if you're moving or not. Its total durability is 4 days or 32 minutes. Very good for pre and mid winter before you can get walking canes for you and your team. 15% doesn't sound like a lot, but every instance of speed you get multiplies with the rest of your speed bonus. So pairing this walking stick with a cobblestone path, for example, will grant you a total of 1.59 times speed bonus. Very valuable before winter, but once everyone has walking canes, this skill has little to no use. Also, yeah, the walking stick has the same kind of problem. It has a slower crafting animation than a normal crafting animation. So, I don't know, kind of weird, but I don't know, it's fine. Moving to the top right of the lumberjack section, we can see the tree guard fella, which says deal a fair amount more damage to tree guards. But how much damage? Well, I tested it, and with the dark sword and... Wait, what? That's a very weird number. Hold on, if I divide that damage number by the Dark Sword base damage, we can figure out the damage multiplier. What, what the- 
This, this damage multiplier is an abomination. Let me check the code. Oh no, look at this. The tier one damage skill versus tree guards has the weirdest calculation in the code. Rather than just applying a damage multiplier, they apply this damage multiplier being the square root of two, which equals one by four, one, four, two, one, three, five. This is stupid. I don't know why they did this. So effectively, you deal 41.42% more damage. But it makes a little more sense when you move on to the second skill, which in the code, they simply do the same thing again, which is multiply the first damage multiplier by the same damage multiplier. So the square root of 2 multiplied by the square root of 2, which equals exactly 2. So great! So the second skill does total a nice double damage multiplier against tree guards specifically. Anyway, moving on to the third skill, which says the following. Learn to craft the tree guard idle. Initially, I thought this just aggro tree guards around you, which it does do, but it also does one other small thing. If there are trees nearby, when burnt, it will spawn up to two tree guards per idle. So using three grass, two living logs, and five nightmare fuel, you can craft one idle. That might sound expensive, but the only expensive part is the nightmare fuel. Since after burning one of these idols, any two trees in a two and a half tower radius around the idol will transform into two tree guards that will aggro on whoever burnt the idol. These tree guards will be of the correct corresponding type depending on the tree. If you spawn two tree guards like this, you profit 10 living logs for every totem that you use. And with the tree guard damage skills, you can dispatch the tree guards quite fast. So you can very much use these idols purely to farm living logs for the team at the cost of nightmare fuel on grass. Also, if you throw an idol into a campfire, it has the same effect as if you're burnt it, causing tree guards to spawn if there are trees nearby. If no player burnt the idol, also, it caught fire by some other means. The spawned tree guards will aggro on the closest player within a three and three quarter tile radius. Totems stack up to ten, and if you burn ten at once, you'll be greeted by twenty tree guards coming for you. Unless, of course, you didn't have twenty trees within a two and a half tile radius to transform them into tree guards. If you don't have enough or any trees around you when you burn the idol, nothing will happen. You may have some horrendous ideas now, such as farming a ton of nightmare fuel and living logs along with some pine cones, planting the pine cones, waiting for them to grow, and spawning yourself an army of tree guards to fight bosses with. This is truly a work of evil and you should be ashamed of having such an idea. Uh, but for science, we tested how many full-grown tree guards it takes to kill Misery Toadstool! Uh, so it takes about 20 tree guards to kill Misery Toadstool, potentially less, but let's explain the method. Bring 10 tree guard idols, 21 pine cones, an axe like Lucy, a torch, some light, a pan flute, a poisoned canary, and maybe some armor to toadstool in the caves. Plant 20 pine cones within a 2.5 tower radius of a central point within the toadstool arena. Then plant one pine cone as close as you can to toadstool. This pine cone is special, as we will need it as a tree later, but not a tree guard. Then wait for about 12 to 18 days for the trees to be fully grown or use Wickerbottom's applied silver culture book to force grow them. After which, place your 10 idols in the center of the trees, making sure that the tree planted next to Toastal won't be transformed into a tree guard, then light the idols on fire. This will spawn 20 aggro tree guards, at which point you will pan flute them back to sleep. Now quickly drop your poisoned canary if you want to fight Misery Toastal, then chop Toastal's cap. Once Toastal pops out of the ground, he will knock down the tree that you planted earlier, causing all the tree guards to wake up and attack Toastal. Tree guards do big damage to NPCs, but Toastal also does big damage. So it's 20 tree guards is enough to kill a misery toadstool, but you will probably need to chop down the mush trees once toadstool starts spawning them, because otherwise he gets a massive damage reduction. You can use the Werebeaver Tail Slap skill here to chop down the mush trees very fast if you want, or just use Lucy as Lucy is good enough. You can also let toadstool kill all the tree guards, then you finish toadstool off. That way you don't need to kill the tree guards, but if you choose to kill them yourself, an effective way of killing them is aggroing all of them with a totem, then charging back and forth as the moose transformation to deal damage to all of them. This method can be applied to any boss which is destructive, so they can knock down a tree to aggro tree guards, or they just have an area effect attack which can aggro the tree guards. But there are some bosses which you won't be able to aggro tree guards onto, but we'll explore this in the new Woody boss run that I'll be doing at some point. Finally, we have the affinity section. Time to choose whether you side with the shadows or the moon. The shadow alignment causes the bone helmet effect to happen when you are in any wear form, uh, kind of. If any shadow creatures were aggroed on you, whether you're insane or not, once you transform, they will de-aggro and won't aggro on you again unless you attack them or transform back to human. Also, holding the attack key won't attack the passive nightmare creatures, but if you force attack them, uh, then you will attack them, causing all of them to aggro on you. Also, the moose's air effect attack won't hit passive shadow creatures while you're insane with this skill. This is also true for the moose's charge attack. It won't hit passive nightmare creatures even if you charge right through them. Also, by default, if you're not insane, but there are shadow creatures around, you won't hit them with the moose's third punch AoE attack. But if you are insane, your AoE punch will hit other people's shadow creatures, only if you're insane. Also, as is true for every affiliation skill, Woody gains 1.1 times damage
damage modifier against lunar aligned enemies and gains a 1.1 times damage reduction modifier versus shadow aligned enemies. And yes, this applies to things like planar damage, which makes them a lot more complicated to work out, and is why I avoided this damage modifier until now. But don't worry, if you thirst for planar math, Wolfgang's guide will have tons of it when I do that video. The lunar affiliation skill simply blocks the full moon from triggering a random transformation. Uh, it's that simple, but quite a nice quality of life skill, as in the late game when moonstorms are active and it's a full moon every night, they won't trigger your random transformation. You can still of course use idols to transform into a specific wear creature, and you still get the full moon wear meter bonus. That being, when the full moon starts, it resets your wear meter to full, and your wear meter drains slower. And as with all lunar affinity skills, you gain 10% damage versus shadow aligned enemies, and 10% damage reduction versus lunar aligned enemies. And that's Woody's skill tree! Now, I will recommend the skill setup that I would go for, but of course, this is my opinion, so it's up to you. I would start by spending my first four points on mastering one of the three transformations. I would personally go for the moose, but if you prefer gathering, then choose the beaver, or if you prefer scouting, choose the goose. I didn't mention yet, but you can only unlock the fourth skill of one of the transformations, not all of them. So you could spend nine points on all the transformation upgrades, but you can only have one of the fourth skills. Moving on, I would then unlock the wood carving skill, the hard wood hat skill, and the wooden walker cane skill. You may want to unlock these earlier if you're in a big team, as that will be a bigger impact than upgrading your transformations. After this, I would unlock all of the tree fella skills, including the tree guard idol, as this is way too fun to pass up. Then before you decide your affiliation skill, to unlock them, you need to spend some more points. So unlock two of the duration skills, and then the affiliation skill that I would choose would be shadow in the early game, but if your world will have or does have moonstorms active a lot, then I would choose the Aluna affinity. Then after you've selected your affiliation, grab the last duration skill and finally curse embracer. That's my recommended skill tree, so uh, let me know what you went for. Hopefully I won't have to remake this video in less than a week after release. Uh, I waited for the beta to be released into the live game to verify that play didn't change anything upon final release, so rest assured, everything I said in this video has been tested quite thoroughly, and in some cases, I and some other helpers in the Twitch chat checked the code to verify values. Most useful being looking up planar damage values, because using quadratic equations with coefficients to try reverse engineer the final damage dealt back to the original physical and planar damage was not fun. Anyway, comment below if I missed anything, although I sincerely hope that I did not miss anything. Also, I'll be making the Wolfgang guide next, then the Wormwood guide, both of which got new skill trees, and then I will redo the boss runs of these three characters, utilizing their new skill trees. For a character like Woody, I might do two boss runs, one using wear forms and one using purely tree guards, but we'll have to wait and see. Also, in my last video, I said my next video was going to be a Wolfgang speedrun with the new Nightmare Wear Pig boss, but uh, if I edit and release that video now, it'll be outdated since Wolfgang has his new skill tree. So I will simply be scrapping that run that I recorded and be redoing it with Wolfgang's new skill tree. Uh, thanks for watching. I am super close to 200,000 subscribers if I haven't already hit it. So make sure to subscribe, like, and pay attention to the new upcoming videos because I will be announcing a few big things soon. But I ain't spoiling what those things are. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for watching. Go watch all my other videos. Follow me on Twitch. Okay, I'm leaving now. Good night.